Sometimes basic things just need to be reviewed. But by way of introduction, is there anyone here who is not aware that there is a war against Christmas going on in contemporary American society? It has gone so far that in recent years the employees in some stores have been penalized even to the extent of losing their jobs for simply wishing a customer a Merry Christmas. I'm not just talking about resisting the commercial materialistic emphasis that drives much of the activities at this time of year. Resistance to that influence is clearly scripturally supportable. No, many of the current adversaries of Christmas promote and profit exceedingly from the commercialism that has become characteristic of the season. They ride on the coattails of and benefit from the traditions of Christmas but refuse to identify with it by name. Yes. Some operate this way because it is their personal position and desire. But some operate this way because the media, certain political and judicial leaders, and a number of very vocal atheistic groups, all of whom compromise a distinct minority of the population in our country, have intimidated them into doing so. Whatever their motivation, these commercial entities insist that Christmas be referred to as winter holiday or some generic equivalent term. They want to displace the familiar time-honored joyful greeting of Merry Christmas with happy holidays, or a comparatively meaningless expression. Perhaps in the past, this alternate greeting was intended to encompass both Christmas and the New Year's holiday in a single expression. For the most part, that is not the case today. So it's not the holiday, per se, that they oppose. It's the name it's the name. Why? Why? Yeah, there you go. I like that because they're sure quick to include that phobe yeah. syllable into, into their um, uh, evaluation of us. It contains the name of Christ. It is one of few remaining allusions, not illusions, but allusions to Jesus Christ promoted on a national scale in the United States. If it can be neutralized by transforming it into something completely secular, the conspiracy to remove the Christian heritage of our country from the national memory, and consciousness will take a giant leap forward. Do you see what I'm saying? You, why is concern about the matter, the matter of Christmas and keeping it alive such a big deal? The answer is because Jesus Christ is such a big deal. Before we're, this, we're through this morning, we'll look once again at the fact of Scripture that Jesus Christ is God. And Psalm 917 teaches that all nations that forget God will be turned into hell. We're well on our way. But in referencing the deity of Jesus Christ at just this point, I am getting ahead of myself. Though we won't possibly be able to finish it, my intention this morning, as time allows, is to review His, meaning Jesus Christ's, incomparable credentials 
but I want to do so in a particular order. Probably most people here, especially those who have, of us who have spent much personal time reading the scriptures and have been under sound Bible preaching and teaching for any length of time, will be familiar with them. But I want to present the key attributes of the Lord together in a package for our reflection and appreciation. This season of the year seems to call for just such a review. So just exactly who is Jesus Christ? Why is it so important to keep his name alive during this season and the rest of the year as well for that matter? Let's begin a thumbnail sketch. I have seven panels, 11 by 17 upstairs, that I hope to dedicate to this in, a, in an abridged form. It will be without the commentary. We can hardly fit an adequate representation of Christ on seven such signs. But we need, to, we need to try. Roman numeral one. He was anticipated in God's unfolding revelation in his humanity as early as Genesis 3.15, shortly after the disobedience and fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Genesis 3.14 and 15 read this way. I'll be turning to a lot of verses. You may not be able to keep up with all of them. You might find some of interest and want to jot down the references. Genesis 3, 14 and 15 say, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. That's an interesting expression. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, um, I'm about to say something here. Let me finish saying it before you, before you um, jump to a conclusion. It's commonly preached and taught by well-meaning individuals that the unusual expression, her seed, is unique to this passage and thus must be a prophecy, because, on that basis, must be a prophecy of the virgin birth of the Savior. Well, later scriptures confirm the virgin birth of Christ, without which he would have inherited the sin nature of fallen man and thus been unqualified to be our Savior. However, the seed of woman concept occurs again in Genesis 16.10 in reference to Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, with no intimation of a virgin birth in the context. Genesis 16.10 says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed, seed of a woman, exceedingly. Because of all the later scriptural support for the truth of the virgin birth, we can legitimately read it into Genesis 3.15. However, however we, we must compare scripture with scripture, that is, compare spiritual things with spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2.13, in order to do so. Roman numeral 2. The details of his birth were prophesied in detail. The details of his birth, and that's, I guess, what brought me to this, this presentation this morning. This is the time of, of year when we, we remember his birth. We're not commanded to remember his birth, per se, but how can we help but do so? He came. He came. That's how he came. First of all, the fact that he was indeed virgin born. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, not a, just a young woman, but a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We see the prophecy fulfilled in Luke 1, 26 to 27, other places as well, but so clearly expressed here, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Matthew 1.18 confirms 
this principle, saying, Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together. Anybody not know what that means? Talk to me afterwards. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So the, his virgin birth was, was foretold. The exact place of his birth was foretold. Yeah. Micah 5, 2, But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. We see the prophecy fulfilled in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 2, verses... And we're going to stop with this one just a little bit in, in a moment. There's some interesting um, considerations here. Um, that we may... Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days... Let me just... I, I'm, I'm going to start over. Probably most individuals here have some kind of a Christmas tradition that, that incorporates remembering in Scripture the events that we are commemorating. But just in case you haven't adopted it, maybe it wasn't in your background, can I really strongly encourage you to somehow incorporate the reading of, of at least one of the the accounts of the birth of Christ uh, in, in conjunction with anything else you may do in observance of Christmas. Luke chapter 2, I guess, is my favorite. Luke 2, verses 1 through 7, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, gr being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There's more to that account of, of the birth in that chapter, but we won't take time to read it right now, it, though it's wonderful. Last night, <clears throat> last night at men's prayer meeting, the issue of whether or not Ruth, remember I said I'd bring this up, the issue of whether or not Ruth could have been included in the physical lineage of David and thus in, 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 of the Lord Jesus Christ if Elimelech had not taken his family to sojourn against the commandment of God in the heathen land of Moab. It, it came up. Well, similarly, uh, similar if-type questions might be asked regarding the circumstances of the birth of Jesus Christ. Let me, let, let me, let me explain. According to Luke 2, verses 4 and 5, Joseph and Mary were initially in the city of Nazareth, not Bethlehem. They weren't there in defiance of, of, of God. They were just there. That's where they were. But in order for the prophecy of Micah 5.2 to be fulfilled, they had to be where? Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus. Here's the question, or at least one of them. What if Caesar Augustus had never decreed the taxing, and particularly with the stipulation that everyone had to participate in the town of his ancestries? Could the prophecy of Micah have been fulfilled? <laughs> I mean, you can go nuts if you, if, you, if, you, if you pursue questions like this too far. If the, if the answer is yes, and it is, then did God put it in the heart of Caesar to decree the taxing? Or did God simply take advantage of what he knew would happen 
in order to accomplish the fulfillment of the prophecy. Which, 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 which? Don't dwell on these questions too long. They'll drive you nuts. Either or both answers are possible. And either way, I believe God intends for us to see his clear fingerprints in the fulfilling of this prophecy in such an unlikely way. Imagine a God big enough to use the IRS of the day to accomplish his will. Wow. That, that's big. That's big. Number three. We're talking about the credentials of Jesus Christ. Number three. He was and is the Son of God. Probably most people in the world, if, if, if considering that truth would think immediately of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten Son. So Jesus Christ was a gift. That he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He was, he was declared to be so on the occasion of his baptism in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this declaration is corroborated in Matthew 17, 5, Mark 1, 11, and 9, 7, um, uh, Luke chapter 3, and, uh, and chapter 9 and verse 35. Well, not only is he the Son of God, he's also God the Son. His deity being repeatedly prophesied in the Old Testament and further declared and confirmed in the New Testament. Isaiah 7.14, by the way, um, we could go to a lot of verses we're not taking time to go to. Uh, and so if, I'm, I'm, I'm galloping. I, I tend to do that when I have everything written out. But if I don't have everything written out, we'll never get where I'm going. Um, if, if you have a favorite verse that speaks to, to any of these, flag me down. I'd like to get my pen out and jot it in. Because I might like your verse better than my verse. And some of you have some good ones, I'm sure. Galatians 4 4. Where 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 do you want to put that in, brother? Okay. All right. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. All right, so he is also God the Son. Again, his deity being repeatedly prophesied in the Old Testament and further declared and confirmed in the New Testament. Isaiah 7, 14. Remember the verse that declared that Jesus would be virgin born also foretold that he would be called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us which detail was fulfilled in Matthew 123. Um, Isaiah 9, 6 states even more assertively that one of his names would be the what? The mighty God. The mighty God. Not a mighty God, by the way. The mighty God. What's the difference? Well, that's definitely all the Excellent, excellent. There's, there's some college English students who couldn't answer that. <laughs> the, the, how many are there when you say the? There's just one. If it's a mighty God, how many are there? Could be any number. I think the word the is one of the most underappreciated words in the Bible because there are some things of which there are only one. For example, Jesus Christ is the way, yeah, the, truth. the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. Um, 
there is a certain so-called version of the Bible that starts out in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God, they say. What, we've got a multiple of possibilities there when we leave that indefinite article dangling there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Um, I'll get off the English. I, I, get, I get into that sometimes. It's in me. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Though many New Testament passages teach the deity of Christ, probably none is clearer and more appropriate to the season than a comparison of John 1, 1 and 2, and verse 14. John 1, 1 and 2, probably many could quote it, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now we drop down to verse 14. Familiar territory to, to most. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. When was the Word made flesh? At Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus Christ. What, are the, what, are, what does a comparison of those verses teach us about Jesus Christ? He was God. Reinforcing this truth and in the same context is John 1.3. John 1.3 says, All things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. This verse ascribes all of creation to Jesus Christ, which Genesis 1.1 ascribes to God. And his eternality and role as creator and sustainer of the universe is even further corroborated by Colossians 1.16 and 17, which reads, for by him, and in the context we understand that, that to mean Jesus Christ, by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Um, according to man's understanding of the structure of the atom, it shouldn't stick together. It should fly apart. Who keeps it stuck together? I'm glad he does. I kind of like sticking together. Yeah, you'd be all over the world. Yep, yep. Still further reinforcement of Christ's, Christ's deity comes from the same verse that prophesied the location of his birth, Micah excuse me, Micah 5.2, which states that his goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That's the Bible expression, meaning that he has existed for all eternity. Well, another credential. In his humanity, his entire life, including his speech, was characterized by perfect sinlessness in fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 9. Isaiah 53, 9 says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. There are other verses that deal with the subject. That's just nice and, and concise and convenient. 1 Peter 2, 22 confirms this, saying, Who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth. Moreover, he always pleased God the Father, of whom he was the physical manifestation. John 8, 29, And he that sent me is with me, Jesus speaking. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do what? Always those things that please him. John 14, 9, we said, we said that Jesus was the physical manifestation of the Father. John 14, 9 says, 
Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen what? The Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Another credential. His three and a half year public ministry was replete with so many miracles that the Apostle John says the world could not hold the books needed to record them. Again, in fulfillment of prophecy. John 21, 25, the last verse of the Gospel of John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Amen. John 14, 11, Jesus speaking, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. This could have been anticipated and should have been anticipated in Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap. By the way, that, that happened in detail. As in heart and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Another credential. Number seven, his voluntary, and that's an important detail, his voluntary substitutionary death by crucifixion paid the penalty for sin and satisfied the righteous demands of holy God for all of mankind, which was his primary mission in coming. You want to know why Jesus Christ came? Three key verses, there are others, but three key verses I always like to to uh, turn to. 1 Timothy 1.15 Paul says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to what? Save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul could write that then because I hadn't been born yet. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. John 10.10 10, the, thief, the thief cometh not but for the for to steal and to kill and to destroy, I am come that they might have what? Life. Life. And that they might have it more abundantly. That means somebody must have been dead. Is that, is that not right? Yes. Yeah. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, not because of them, but they manifested your condition. Number eight, his work of redemption so satisfied God on our behalf that anyone can go to heaven on his merits alone if they'll simply believe it. Amen. Isaiah 53, 11, He, God the Father, shall see of the travail of his, Jesus Christ's soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He bore mine, he bore yours. John 19, 30, is when it was accomplished, when Jesus therefore, this is on the cross, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation, which our pastor has taught us means satisfactory sacrifice. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Even people who die and go to hell had their sins paid for. Yep. Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. John 14.6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Number nine, he has vital, present and future ministries spelled out in Scripture as well. Further credentials that we really don't have time to develop this morning. This is just a thumbnail sketch. Just a thumbnail sketch. If these verses are true, amen, and they are, I heard a couple, and they are, for the sake of our unsaved neighbors, 
friends and loved ones, as well as for the sake of world missions as we know them, and for the very health and future of our country, we ought to be doing all we can to keep the name of Jesus Christ before others. We can't let it be snuffed out. We ought to be even more vocal than the atheists. We ought to overwhelm store cashiers, clerks, and managers with warm, genuine Christmas greetings. I have a little button here. It says, it's okay, wish me a Merry Christmas. So that, so that a store clerk doesn't feel threatened by, the, by, the, by possible reprisal if, if they initiate such a greeting. And such a simple gesture as initiating a sincere Merry Christmas to a store employee may well open the door at some point for sharing from the Word of God without which no man can be saved. 1 Peter 1, 23. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Unknown. Unknown. Yeah, good point, good point. It's subtle the way it creeps in, isn't it? Yes, Bruce? Uh, that X-Miss business started after Madeline Murley O'Hare yep. got the prayer out of school out back of school. in 60. I remember when I was a young man growing up, young kid growing up, that it was Christmas, Christmas, till about 65, 66. Then they started Xing the Christ out, and there's good reason for that. That movement started back then. There was a concerted satanic movement to eliminate Christ in secular life. And so it's perfectly natural at this point to, since texting is, a, is, is um, abbreviating everything, to just carry it on there. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, brother. One another good verse in John 3, 17, speaking of God himself, says, For God sent not his Son to the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. 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 You yes, know, sir. People, you know, the people uh, of this, they think that the uh, X must have started, uh, but Paul told them that there's a marked grave. It was unknown God. He said, I'm going to preach about the unknown God. That was the X must have started. Yeah, okay. All right, any other? Yes, sir. Uh, on the word D, that we emphasize the word D, Revelation 21, 6. He said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning right. and the end. Okay, there it is again. There it is again. Well, I appreciate your patience. I galloped through, hardly gave you a chance. Um, anyway, I was helpful. Let's pray. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, the reason it's important that uh, Christ be born of a virgin you can ask anybody that raises hogs, cows, anything else. They get a bull or a, a boar or whatever it might be to make their uh, uh, stock grow higher. The reason that Mary had to be conceived of the Holy Ghost of the blood that came from God was pure. Amen. If you come from man, it's been changed. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Christmas. Thank you that Jesus came. Thank you that he fulfilled his mission and help us to proclaim what he provided in, in fulfilling that mission faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.